Okay, first I have to... Hi, I'm Max. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer of this uh, conference for inviting me here and talking about uh, some uh, uh, free energy or enhanced sampling method. And uh, the idea is uh, in these uh, two hours to introduce a couple of uh, uh, well-established and uh, very popular methods and then try immediately to uh, get our hands on the computer and trying to apply what we have learned uh, in, uh, in these two hours. So uh, for this reason I will try to uh, give a brief introduction to the theory of the methods and trying to spend time on examples and try to see what are the mistakes that uh, one should not uh, uh, do. And are very, some are very common and uh, everybody uh, do that, so don't feel guilty if you if you feel if you commit some of these mistakes. So as uh, uh, Giovanni was uh, introducing to you, uh, the in general uh, system are very complex, and for energetic or entropic reason, uh, sampling all the configuration space can be extremely difficult, uh, and. Uh, given a certain potential energy function. Uh, the idea behind many methods is uh, what happens if, uh, if I change a little bit the parameters of my potential energy function. Uh, can I access more easily to this... Uh, okay, can I, if I, with a small changes in the parameters uh, of my potential energy function on the temperature of the system can access more easily to other likely region of my phase space. And uh, this can be temperature or can be uh, tuning a little bit some interaction of my potential energy function, maybe switching off uh, some uh, nasty terms that prevent me from sampling efficiently. So there is a broad categor category of method which are based on this assumption. So create uh, a so-called auxiliary system in which the sampling is somehow easier, faster, better. And uh, this is not enough because in the end you want to study your original system. You want to say something about properties in the original system. So you want somehow to connect uh, this uh, uh, sampling in a different uh, situation with your original uh, Hamiltonian or potential energy function. This is what is called going back to your original system, what is commonly called as reweighting. So you want to be able to reweight your, somehow, your simulation. So there is a, a trade-off somehow. If you change too much your potential energy function and visit maybe a region of the phase space that are not relevant to your original uh, system, you are not gaining that much. Or that this reweighting is highly inefficient because you are simply sampling another universe. And uh, so there is a trade-off. We have to change a little bit, but not too much. So the schemes that I will present uh, uh, in this lecture are simulated annealing, simulated tempering, and rapid exchange methods. Are you some, some of you are familiar with this method, like simulated annealing? Yes. Simulated tempering? Somebody use simulated tempering? Rapid exchange methods? I guess so. I saw a couple of posters. Okay. So we try to start. Not all of these uh, methods obey these two rules. We start with the first one, which we'll see in a while. Is not, uh, uh, does not have these properties. So simulated annealing is, is inspired by metallurgy, but it's very uh, known that if you eat up your system and then cool it down slowly, you can relax some internal stress and uh, make your material some escape some bad conformation and, and relax to something better in uh, just waiting for to for the cool down of your system. So this is the basic idea. And uh, I look in Wikipedia how to define simulated annealing is a metaheuristic algorithm, which I don't know exactly what 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 it means for a global optimization. <laughs> so it's a procedure for optimize your configuration and get them better somehow. So to do this, you need to define something. So this is pretty general. It's the measure of quality of your configuration. You can call it energy, or in some domain of science, it's called fitness. So it's exactly the same thing. Uh, maybe energy, what is good as low energy in fitness, what is good as high fitness. But 
the idea is the same. Then, uh, to perform simulated annealing, you need to you need a protocol to generate some candidates. Somehow, you want to generate uh, confirmation, and then you want to accept or reject this new confirmation. And the requirement for simulated annealing is that this uh, uh, acceptance should depend by the difference in fitness between the new or energy between the new and old, and an external parameter. Uh, the external parameter. I call it T, general temperature, but it's an abstract parameter. The only requirement is that if I take a very small value of this parameter, I just accept moves that was in a better configuration with respect to the, to the energy of fitness function. <coughs> the limit is for T so small, just downhill moves are accepted. Then there are optimization protocols like this greedy algorithm that are based just on downhill moves toward the best. And uh, on the other side, as the temperature grows, you want to be able to accept uh, uh, moves that brings you to unfavor the configuration with higher and higher uh, probability. So one example of such a uh, scheme for the acceptance is uh, the Metropolis criterion that uh, Giovanni introduced. So it's just you take the um, the difference in fitness of energy divided by the temperature, and then you accept or reject based on this probability. So this is what you need to do, and then the workflow, is a, the workflow of a simulated annealing is, is pretty uh, simple. You <coughs> initialize your system at this high value of your parameter, and then you generate moves. You will uh, accept uh, the high frequency, all kind of moves. Uh, and uh, so you have to generate, you have to assess, uh, and uh, if it's not good, you go ahead and generate new one uh, until you, yes. Is T temperature or anything? It's just a parameter of your uh, of your fitness or energy function. It doesn't need to be a, a real temperature. And we will see an example in uh, in uh, in uh, in one slide. And then you have a uh, you have a, another parameter that says, okay. Uh, do I, do I, did I reach the maximum number of attempts at this value of the parameter? Yes or no? If no, if yes, you decrease this parameter. So you start accepting more and more just move that goes toward a better configuration. And uh, that's it, basically, until you, you, you obtain a very, you, you go to a very small value of this parameter. And yes? How, how would you go about finding like, the, the the probability is just uh, once you you have your new configuration or your uh, you are proposing, so you have a method to propose a new configuration that's just a function of this, uh, of this uh, configuration. You have to define an abstract object, which is how good is this configuration, it depends just on the coordinates, and that's it. Once you have a method to propose the, co the, the new one, uh, there's nothing that you can do. And you, once you have fixed uh, your uh, acceptance, uh, uh, you are defining an acceptance probability. It's kind of arbitrary. The, the bottom line is that you want to start your simulation in, with, in such condition that you don't get trapped in, uh, in local minima. So in the beginning, you just uh, let your system uh, move and escape from uh, maybe local good configuration, but not uh, really the global good one. It's, a, it's kind of uh, uh, empirical how much, uh, how fast you decrease, uh, to how long is your, uh, is your simulation at a given temperature. It's kind of arbitrary, and that's one of the limitations of this of this approach. So, this was the first application in the in the 80s, a long time ago. So, just to give you an example, the first Mac was there at ten thousand dollar for one megabyte of memory. So, it was really, really a long time ago. And the application was uh, uh, it was a era of IBM. So, it was how to optimize the connection between chips of an IBM processor. And uh, what you want to do, your fitness is, uh, I want to minimize the length of this wire to connect all those chips, uh, and I don't want to bend them, but I want to spread around all the processors. So this is qualitative what you want to, to do. 
And then uh, <coughs> they compare the authors of this paper, uh, random uh, uh, criteria for connecting uh, chips, and uh, they're simulating annealing. And what they, what, what, they, what they observe is that with this procedure, the density at the end of the day is more uniform of wires, and you satisfy more this, uh, this criteria with respect to a random generation uh, attachment of, of the chips. He is a very uh, practical example. So, good. This is uh, one first example of using tempering a little bit with your system and trying to uh, escape uh, local region of your face space when you would be trapped otherwise. And the problem, what are the problems of such a, a, a procedure? The results depend uh, on the annealing schedule, schedule, how fast uh, am I cooling down, and uh, you are not really, uh, since you are changing your, uh, your potential energy function in a non-controlled way, you just, uh, every n step you just change this parameter, uh, there's no formal way uh, to uh, uh, control how this configuration are distributed, because you are, you are doing something which is too violent, to your system, and then reweighting, going back to whatever is your, in, where is your temperature of instance, is is impossible. So, it's a protocol. It's a meteoristic protocol to find a good solution or escape from local minima, but to sample a well-defined distribution cannot be used. So this brings us to the next step, <coughs> which is called simulated tempering. The idea is uh, is uh, is the same to use temper to, to accelerate uh, uh, sampling in your scheme, but you want to do it in a more formal way to be able to recover uh, equilibrium distribution from your simulation. So the idea is to, the temperature is itself a dynamical variable, a variable you want to sample temperature as long, uh, along with the coordinates of your system. So to do this, uh, to your Boltzmann weight, which is the, uh, the weight of, with which configuration are distributed at a certain temperature, you add another term, this function, just of the temperature. So this is how you generate in your Monte Carlo, for example, procedure, new configuration. This is the distribution that you want to sample. And you want to choose this function in such a way that the temperature space is sampled uniformly. So you want to be able to have a configuration that change uh, temperature in a controlled way and sample a range of temperature uniformly so that you can uh, access to high temperature and trying to escape whatever bad configuration or local minima you are trapped into and then sample your temperature of reference in a controlled way. So how can you do that? Three steps this procedure. The first one, you have to determine this weight function, the one that needs you to diffusion temperature space. The second thing is that uh, you have to perform, once you have fixed, you have, you have determined this weight, you have to perform a simulation, which is both in Cartesian coordinates and in temperature. And then you, you have to calculate the average of the quantity of interest. So often the temperature space is discretized, so you have just a, a finite number of, uh, of temperature that you can sample. So determine the function means determine these n m weights. And the procedure is uh, kind of uh, complicated. So it's uh, the classic, there are, there, okay, there are many ways to optimize uh, many recip uh, recipes that have been developed so far for determining this weight. The original one uh, proceeds in, uh, in this way. So first you start with one, um, uh, start to simulate, uh, you, you decide the range of temperature and you simulate uh, your system at the high possible temperature just with the canonical weight. And what you want to do is to accumulate uh, some quantities during this uh, trial simulation. And, uh, the first one is the average potential energy at each temperature, and then you want to, uh, when you ch when we start changing temperature and exploring other temperatures, to accumulate an histogram in in the temperature space. So you start with this simulation, just normal simulation at at high temperature, and then what you do, 
with your uh, uh, histogram and with your average energy, you start defining this way in an iterative way, starting from uh, the last one to the previous temperature, so the highest minus one. And this is the first attempt for the, uh, so in, the, in this first stage of, the, of iteration, here is uh, the last one, okay, the highest temperature. You, this initially is set, uh, is, uh, you, you don't have nothing, so it's just the logarithm of, uh, of, the, of the histogram. And then for uh, uh, the maximum minus one, you give this first estimate, the other, you cannot say anything for the moment. And then what you want to do is to simulate other temperatures, so one more with respect to the, to the last one, and uh, now no more with just the Boltzmann weight, but you start with this estimate of your weights. And that's basically what you do, and you accumulate the usual quantities, average and histogram. And then after some time you ask, you monitor your histogram in temperature, and what you want to uh, reach is uh, a flat distribution in temperature space, at least in the small interval of temperature that uh, you are sampling. If you observe this, uh, what you do is just say, okay, I have a good or uh, reasonable estimate for these two temperatures, let's add, add one more uh, temperature to my list. So this uh, M is set to M minus 1. And you go on and you iterate this, uh, this circular until you you go down your ladder in, in temperature. And this, so here is the last one, and they escape, let's say, from this cycle in when you're happy with your all full of temperature, that your histogram in, this, in, in the temperature dimension is flat. So as you can see, it's something uh, that requires some trial simulation and accumulation of average histogram uh, update of weight until you're happy with the diffusion in temperature. This is just the first part of the of the story, because now you have uh, something that guarantees you diffusion in temperature. Now you want to sample coordinate and temperature space, and you do this in what's so called deep sampling uh, scheme, so when you have a joint probability distribution, so a probability, uh, we are treating the temperature as a dynamic uh, variable, so we have a probability of coordinate and temperature, so you, don't, you want to sample uh, not this joint probability distribution, but the conditional distribution. So, fix the value of the temperature, I want to sample the configurational space. Or, on, on the other side, fix uh, a, a given configuration, I want to sample somehow temperature. Is this clear? Is the first time you heard about deep sampling? Yes. Okay, it's, 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 it's kind of uh, um, easy, the implementation. So, you the first uh, step, so it's iterative, uh, Proceeding the first step, you fix temperature and then you perform a canonical sampling with molecular dynamics of Monte Carlo for a certain number of steps. And then you freeze your coordinates and you try to evolve, let's say, the temperature. And you do in a, for example, in a Monte Carlo uh, fashion. So you tend to move to a neighbor temperature at fixed coordinates. And to do this, you follow the usual metropolis criterion. And if you calculate it, you have a terms which is uh, <coughs> related to the different temperature and then you have this parameter. So here is the trick, because you have determined this parameter in such a way, you can see this, that you are able to diffuse in the temperature easily. So this is basically what you have to do. Is this, uh, is this clear? Any questions? Yes. If you talk to someone not not temperature or pressure, Sorry, can you say it again? Constant temperature pressure, the number of moles for the Gibbs ensemble. No, uh, this is a, uh, it's not the same thing. Here we're talking about Gibbs sampling as a, as a way to sample a, a joint probability distribution. So it's not, it's not the, we're talking about something slightly different. So here is a simulation at constant temperature, uh, a simulation in temperature and coordinates, and as a way to sample these two variables instead of drawing them from a joint probability distribution, you sample in different steps. And without going into the details, so this procedure, with this kind of moves, lead to a, sa a correct sampling of the joint probability distribution. Okay, so this is what you have to do, 
and then you want to calculate some properties. Uh, and one way to do this is to use your own simulation, so at different temperature. To so you are interested in in, in evaluate properties, for example, at uh, one single temperature. But to do this, uh, the optimal way turns out to be to collect all the simulation and all the different temperatures, uh, use them to estimate the density of state in the energy uh, with, with a procedure which is called multiple histogram and reweighting technique. I, I will not say anything more about this because we will talk about this kind of techniques in the next hour, I think. And But the bottom line is I have multiple simulations. I want to exploit all of them to give the best estimate of some quantities. And this quantity is the density of state in, in energy. And then you use this to, to calculate averages of, of properties. So this is uh, the basic idea of the simulated temper tempering technique. As you can see, this is kind of a, a multi-step process in which first you have to determine these weight factors. These are the quantities that need to, to make uh, your system diffuse in the, in the temperature space. So the idea of replicate change is trying to make life a little bit easier and get rid of this, uh, of this uh, um, optimization or weight determination uh, part. So the idea is to take uh, n copies of your systems and simulate them independently. Independently, these, these uh, copies of your system Uh, let's make this, uh, this assumption, they have the same temperature, it doesn't need to be like this, but just for uh, simplicity for the moment, let's consider the same temperature, but they have a slightly different potential energy function. So, you want to simulate all of them independently, one of them hopefully is the potential energy func function you are interested in, the other ones are chosen in such a way that somehow sampling is much easier, is accelerated. Uh, this is kind of a uh, general statement because you don't know exactly what, uh, or it's difficult to say exactly what do I have to change, how much do I have to change my, my potential energy function to accelerate sampling. But let's imagine we have a recipe uh, to change some of the parameters and have a better, uh, uh, that makes our life much easier. So we simulate a, uh, uh, an ensemble of replica of the system starting from the real one and with the, this uh, auxiliary system that might be completely unphys unphysical. So you can play whatever 30 games uh, you want. So the idea is uh, that you want to simulate independently but as a certain uh, uh, step of your simulation trying to exchange configuration because you want to give the possibility to Your, the configuration that are subject to the real potential energy function which gets stuck in, in local minima to, uh, explore, to experience this good potential. So you want to exchange and, 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 and reach this, this good potential energy function. Uh, it's, it's, okay, if, if you have among these potential energy function the one that you're interested in, you're very happy because in the end you just, you might think, okay, I just look at this, uh, Uh, this uh, uh, replica, and I can calculate whatever quantities uh, I need without any kind of reweighting or uh, of uh, of my configuration, because uh, they are already. If I do things in a certain way, they are distributed uh, correctly according to the ensemble I'm interested in, and then I just throw away all the auxiliary system and physical that I use just for helping me sampling. Okay, so the thing is. How should I exchange between these uh, replicas to... Oh, sorry, this is a movie. I will admit this. Okay. So how uh, I supposed to regulate uh, this exchange process? Uh, what I want at the end of the day, is what I was telling you, is to reach an equilibrium distribution. So I want uh, Uh, each of the replica of my standing system to be distributed according to a distribution. So, uh, one way to do this, a uh, sufficient way to, to, to enforce this, uh, this, this uh, uh, condition, 
is to impose the detailed balance to the transition probability. Giovanni already told you everything about ba balance and detailed balance. Uh, to derive uh, a recipe for the transition probability, it is sufficient that you impose the detailed balance to the probability. So, uh, somehow the probability, okay, here is the probability in this extended system, so you have n replica of my, of my system, and these are the configuration in each of the replica. Imagine I want to do an exchange between configuration j, in replica j, and replica k, and with a certain transition probability. So basically what I have to impose is that the number of exchanges, let's say, in one direction is equal to the number of exchanges in the other direction. So the probability of populate that state times the transition probability in the direction j to k must be equal to the probability of populating the state in which j and k are switched multiplied by the transition, of doing the, the transition probability of doing the reverse process. So this is the condition of detailed balance that I have to impose, that I can impose. It's sufficient that I, that I impose this to obtain an equilibrium distribution. So practically, uh, the, receipt, the recipe that uh, come out of this is uh, pretty easy. So the system is, uh, the replica are independent, so the probability of extended state is just the product of the probability of a single uh, state, uh, which is, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm imagine I'm sampling a constant temperature, and so it's, they are distributed according to the Boltzmann weight. So the probability of extended state is just the product of this. So, uh, I'm doing the exchange between J and K, so I'm just writing this to make clear when J and K are in this product, but this is pretty uh, easy. And then the probability after making the exchange, you just make uh, uh, the exchange between the configuration K and J. So this is pretty clear. If we plug this in the relation from the detailed balance that we saw in the, in the previous slide, we can obtain a relation between the ratio of uh, transition probability in one direction and in the other direction. And if you do that, uh, it's easy to see that you obtain the exponential of this minus delta, which is a difference uh, which in which, in this quantity, uh, compare just different of energy, uh, of uh, the energy of one replica and on the other replica, evaluated on both configurations. So you have, you have to assess uh, each co how happy is each configuration with one uh, potential energy function and with the other potential energy function. In the end of the day, you have four terms, of two configuration and two potential energy function. And this is what you, you have to evaluate to accept or reject <coughs> your exchange. So this is, uh, again, a requirement for the transition probability uh, to, that is sufficient to guarantee to reach an equilibrium distribution. If uh, you uh, accept or reject the exchange with the usual metropolis criterion with delta defined as in the previous slide, you uh, uh, meet the criteria in the previous slide. So it is sufficient that you do your simulation completely independent. After a certain step, you say, okay, let's try with this exchange. You calculate this quantity, you accept or reject based on this probability. That's it. <coughs> Is this clear? Okay. okay. Uh, so, as, as I, we were noticing before, the acceptance depends just on difference of energies. Here we, we assume that the temperature is the same, it can be different and we will see in the, in the next few slides. And uh, what you also, you, you notice about this, that I don't have to uh, compute or estimate any weights, just difference of energies. Once I decide uh, what are these modifications, potential energy function, how to set these replicas, I don't have to tune a lot of things. Because some of these terms that I, in the previous method I need to determine it, just cancel out in this procedure, and what you obtain is just different of energies. Uh, at the price of simulating multiple copies of your system, that might be completely unphysical, and for which it's, diff it's difficult to, to do something with this. Okay, I want to show you one example uh, of this uh, procedure, metric exchange. 
and uh, apply to uh, biological system. So first, uh, it's just an example of how you can play with your potential energy function. So here the authors is uh, Bruce Bern, it's a PNAS in 2005, it's called Solute Tempering, the method of replica exchange with solute tempering. Here is the potential energy of your system in the replica M, and uh, it's, uh, these terms are protein-protein uh, uh, protein interaction terms, and then you have a pro uh, term of interaction of water with water because he is simulating his protein is an explicit uh, bath. And then there is the interaction of the protein with the solvent. So the, the authors decide, okay, I want to change, modulate this interaction. I will not change at all the term protein-protein interaction. This is there. I don't want to play with it. I'm rescaling the water-water term and the protein-water term. Uh, and the parameter of this scale in this case is temperature, so I'm, I'm changing also temperature, but for the moment, let's forget about this. So this is the very res recipes for changing the Hamiltonian of the system. Uh, you can see that uh, at, uh, you start from an initial temperature, that is one that you are interested in usually, as, a, as you can see when m is equal to zero, you just recover your normal potential energy function. So you have one replica which is physical, the other one are completely physical. So if you calculate the, the, the nice thing of this uh, way of changing your Hamiltonian is once you, uh, you calculate the, the acceptance ratio with the formula described uh, in, in the previous slide, which is this, this thing, what you notice that there's no water-water term in this part. So we will see in the, in the next slide what is the how difficult it is what 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 is the problem in exchange? What do you need to have to exchange in in a efficient way? And most of the problems comes when you have a lot of degrees of freedom of your system. And uh, so for solvated system, and, and Giovanni already mentioned the, the effect of water is just to increase enormously the number of degrees of freedom of your system. This is what uh, uh, make the efficiency of your exchange. Uh, uh, very low unless you do something like uh, increasing the number of replicas and we, we will see in the, in the next slide. So the nice thing is here there's nothing related to water-water uh, interaction in the exchange rate. So if you look at the distribution of these energies in a, in a normal, in, a, in, the, in the replica exchange with soil tempering, here it is, and this is, uh, so they start from 300 Kelvin, I will, we will see the detail in the next slide, and up to 600 Kelvin. Here is, uh, uh, is uh, the case in which uh, you don't have a rescaling of the, of the energy terms, but just a change in the temperature. And here, is, this is called parallel tempering, just a special case of, of a repeated change, and I will have examples of this. So it's temperature can, you can see as a full rescaling of your potential energy function. Here, I'm just changing that term, and so when you calculate the acceptance of uh, the acceptance ratio, you have water-water terms there, that makes life pretty difficult, and so to, to cover the same space of temperature, you need the many more replicas. It will be much clearer in a, in a, in a few slides. Here is just, uh, I want to underline the fact that because of this uh, you can uh, gain a lot in as far as number of replicas needed to cover a certain temperature space. If it's not very clear, hopefully it will be clear in a couple of slides. Yes? Uh, different water models are very different between conditions. Uh, does it in any way the, the rate of validity, because this means that water can move, and if you change the temperature, uh, it's not the same to do uh, uh, the, the replicas with the deep than with the DC points. But formally, it, it, it doesn't matter the diffusion coefficient because. because, because have, have you seen any difference in doing with different water models? I think they never tried different water models. There are other problems, and I will show the problems of this uh, approach, but I think they didn't try with other 
water molecules. They try a partial approach in which they keep they kept some water molecule close to the protein surface because the effect of this was uh, uh, so why solute temper? Because this is formally equivalent of having a different temperature, right, for, for the solute part and the water. And uh, the thing that they feared about in the beginning was, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm like making my protein very hot, but in the end the water surrounding the protein is at the normal temperature. Maybe this is not that good for something. So my what I, what, what I hope to be the hottest replica, the one that announced sampling, actually is not is not doing its job because I have a bath of cold water. So what they try to do is to just leave a few enough waters there to to not to have a completely frozen bath or something like this. But I don't think they try with different water uh, models. So the the one of the Best cases in this uh, situation, in when, when you want to assess your uh, uh, new free energy method, uh, is uh, one, one of the favorite seasons is Alan deeper padding water. We will play it a lot with this, uh, hopefully in the, uh, in the, in the afternoon. So I think you know, have, all, all of you knows uh, uh, this system. It's characterized by two dihedral angles and the transition, especially of one of these two, uh, a dihedra is uh, very difficult at room temperature, and uh, so this is a perfect benchmark, uh, or a good benchmark for any enhanced sampling technique. So they compare their approach with just three replicas at these temperatures, and a normal replica exchange with just the temperature as a, as a, as a parameter. And first, qualitative, they want to see if they, in a short time scale you observe this transition. You can really jump from different parts of your phase space. In normal molecular dynamics, this is a really a rare event, at least in the nanosecond time scale. I think this is CPU unit, so you count what you spend actually, not the time length of one single simulation. So it's multiplied by the number of replicas. This is what your price for, for, for your simulation. And, uh, what they claim is that these transitions somehow are accelerated uh, by the replica change, this is true, and uh, with uh, less expense uh, they are as well accelerated by the procedure. But this is just a qualitative argument of saying, okay, I'm, uh, I'm accelerating compared to normal molecular dynamics. This is uh, 300 Kelvin replica. This is, uh, yes, this is 300 Kelvin replica, I think so, yes. So usually, uh, when you uh, analyze the, uh, usually it's in, the replica exchange is implemented in such a way when when you do the exchange, you do really the exchange of configuration. So if you look at a single temperature, you have a discontinuous trajectory. So this is why you see jumps. Uh, you might as well think of uh, uh, swapping. Uh, the parameter of your Hamiltonian. So if you sit on one CPU, you just see a continuous trajectory, but a different values of your parameters. So this is two, two way of implementing it. Uh, the Gromax package that we are, thi I think we are going to use in the afternoon, implement, implements the former way. So you have this continuous trajectory, but at the same value of it. Okay. Then what, oh, this is not very clear. This is nice that you, you accelerate the transition between two states, but in the end of the day, you, you are interested in uh, how well you can reconstruct your old free energy surface as a function of these two dihedrals. And this is, uh, they compared uh, a norm, uh, their uh, technique with the standard replica exchange, uh, starting from two different configurations, and they were happy because uh, they reconstruct the population of this uh, uh, state in the Ramachandran plot, uh, as well as, as uh, here is the replica exchange sort of tempering, as well as, as the replica exchange with a fraction of the computational cost. And, uh, oh, it's very late. I can skip this. And they, and they try to measure how uh, the efficiency of the algorithm with some kind of measure of ergodicity, but I can, I can skip this part. Okay, so uh, do you understand the basic idea of a replica exchange? You have different. Uh, copy of your system with a modification of a potential energy function and somehow these uh, uh, replicas helps you help you uh, with sampling and you want to exchange to go there to experience that potential 
and then uh, try to escape from your traps. One particular choice of parameter to change is the temperature, and this is what the incarnation of a replica change with this temper with this parameter is called parallel temper, but formally is the same. And copies of your system, different temperatures. If you work out the yes, uh, replica exchange methods. So it's a broad class of uh, of methods based based on the same idea. And parallel temper is what is belongs to the to this class. So here, same potential energy function, but different temperatures. If you work out the um, the relation for, for the transition probability, the acceptance uh, of your exchange uh, in a exactly the same way. You find this much shorter uh, expression. It's just the difference in temperatures uh, that appear there and the different potential energy in the two configurations. So same thing that you have to do, no optimization of weight, just evaluation of differences of potential energy. OK, so just a very short uh, history. Uh, the original uh, the first application uh, dates back to the 80s. It was a Monte Carlo simulation of spin glasses. In the first application, the exchange was even not of a full configuration, but just a mix of pa part of the configuration. So to, to get the first application when there was a swap of entire configuration, you have to go to the 90s. And uh, for the simulation of biomolecules, there are two names that I have to mention. Uh, the first one is uh, Uri Gansman, who did his first Monte Carlo simulation of a small peptide in 97. So at that time, probably RNA peptide was not that popular because he tried on on, a, on another uh, very short peptide. Uh, this was a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, as far as molecular dynamics is concerned, you have to wait a couple of years to have an application on uh, on biomolecules. And the name that you will find everywhere in the literature of parallel tempering as Sujita Okamoto, 99. So again, uh, not RNA peptide, but glycine, uh, always a peptide. So it's just a, a, a picture to compare. So it's a parallel tempering between these two temperatures, and they compare the distribution again of the dihedral angles in normal standard molecular dynamics and with their parallel tempering. And you can see that uh, in molecular dynamics, basically, you get stuck in this, uh, in this position for their competition during their simulation with parallel tempering you are able to uh, sample correctly hopefully uh, all the relevant states in the Ramachandran plot and uh, at high temperature you see that molecular dynamics and parallel tempering are kind of more similar than, than at low temperature so uh, this is just to this is just to the first application of molecular dynamics for parallel tempering there are a couple of th things that I would like to 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 point out for uh, uh, application of parallel tempering schemes and molecular dynamics. First, uh, it's uh, when you swap configuration, traditionally in molecular dynamics uh, application of parallel tempering, uh, you do a rescale of, uh, of the velocities of your system. So you have a, a configuration that is, that is sampling a certain uh, Hamiltonian at a given temperature, so the velocities are distributed in a certain way, and then you exchange, you you put this step, this configuration in a correct way, let's say, uh, to a different temperature, and you want uh, to bring the velocity from the old temperature with you, and to rescale them in order for them to uh, belong to the distribution at the new temperature. So what you have to do. Uh, is just uh, so these are the velocity before this exchange with J, this after, so you just it's very simple because the rescaling factor goes like the square root of the ratio of the temperature. So this is uh, uh, the difference, the only difference that you have to do with molecular dynamics. When you up update your temperature, you, you rescale your velocities. Second thing, so we have um, seen that the, the exchange. Uh, uh, the quantity that regulates the change depends on difference of energy. And uh, so you want uh, you want to to get uh, that quantity right and you want to get at any given temperature 
the right distribution of energy. So you want the right value of the average and the right fluctuations. So yesterday, uh, Giovanni uh, did this beautiful lecture on thermostat, and he, show, he showed uh, that uh, uh, with some thermostat, uh, you get the right average uh, uh, energy by construction, but you you miss somehow, you get the fluctuation not, not correctly. It's especially important for parallel tempering since the exchange is based on overlap of energy distribution, on fluctuation of energy, to get to have the right ensemble. So when you do molecular dynamic simulation with parallel tempering, you have one more reason to use uh, uh, the right thermostat or, or a thermostat. So there is a very nice paper from 2009 that compare the effect of two different thermostat on the uh, uh, on a simulation of uh, R5, and uh, the effect is not uh, marginal. So the effect is on the population of two different states, a folded state and unfolded state, as determined by the parallel tempering uh, simulation with two different thermostat. So here is uh, with uh, let's say uh, I don't remember which which thermostat, yes, an Arrangevin thermostat, and uh, you have uh, uh, the blue one is uh, a low temperature distribution, folded and unfolded, and the red one is, uh, is a high temperature, yes. And, the, the, and here in this part is uh, uh, the fraction of folded and unfolded state, how it changes with, uh, with temperature. So, as you can see, the blue one is that when you use a range event thermostat, it gives you the proper uh, fluctuation distribution. And here, we, when you use a weak coupling scheme. So, you can see that uh, close to this point, uh, the, the population uh, uh, between the two states are recovered correctly with a bad thermostat. But this is a very bad trend. So, the fat is a very low temperature you are increasing the population of the folded state and decreasing the one of them folded. A very high temperature, you are decreasing the population with respect to the correct one of the folded state and increasing the one of them folded. This is due to the fact that you don't have the right distribution of energy. You have a narrower distribution of energy when you use uh, this kind of thermostat and then put a bias uh, uh, leads to a bias in how the exchange are done. So there, there, there is a, there are favorite the exchange between uh, something that is uh, at low temperature but is unfolded and something that is a high temperature but is folded. So there is a bias toward this exchange that screw up, screws up your this recovery distribution. So be careful when you do molecular dynamics with parallel tempering to use uh, the right thermostat or at least a thermostat. A proper terms. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the basic uh, of a parallel tempering uh, and molecular dynamics, and the quantity uh, that determines the acceptance rate is this one. We have derived this, and uh, as I, I show you, is based on difference differences of energy. So what is important to have an efficient exchange of configuration is that uh, the distribution of energy in two different replicas has some kind of overlap. If these are completely far apart, you can calculate this quantity, but you will never get an, uh, an acceptance, uh, uh, satisfying acceptance when you try to exchange if these distributions are separate. Is this clear? No question? Oh. So, this is, uh, is very, so this is the distribution of uh, energy at two different temperatures. So it's uh, something centered uh, on an average value with certain fluctuation. So if uh, you measure the difference between the peak of this distribution, between the average values, this is uh, something that is related to the specific heat. So the specific heat uh, constant volume is the derivative with, with, with respect to the temperature of the average value of, uh, uh, of the energy. So if you, if you measure the difference between average value and two temperature, this is proportional to the specific heat of the system. While the fluctuations here was like the square root of the specific heat of your system. 
So, what does this mean? That when you, uh, this means that if you want overlap, so the peak of this distribution depends on the, of the uh, specific heat uh, of your system at that temperature. So if, if there are regions, if the specific heat is, is constant, you can think that you can put a regular distribution of replica because the distance between the peak of this distribution is almost the same across the temperature range. If you have a peak in your specific heat as a function of the temperature, it means that there is a region of the temperature space in which suddenly the distribution of energy becomes more apart than the rest of your uh, temperature space. So in this particular region of the phase space, in which the peaks are far apart, you want to increase the distribution of replicas if you want to uh, exchange properly, because this is a problematic point. And uh, there is another consequence, is uh, if this goes like the specific heat, this distance between peaks, and the fluctuation goes like the square root of a specific heat, it means that if uh, you want to cover a given space of your temperature space, uh, the number of replica that you need uh, goes like the square root. So you want to fill this uh, uh, range with uh, replicas. So the number that you need goes like the square root of a, of a specific heat, because this is uh, the width, C, and this is uh, the uh, fluctuation of a given temperature. Is this clear? So, the specific, how the specific it goes with temperature determine more or less where you have, how you have to place your, your replicas because you want to ensure overlap between the distribution of energy at different temperatures. The problem when, uh, is that the number needed to cover a certain space goes like the square root of a specific heat. So, when the, the system uh, uh, size increases, the scaling might cause like the square root of a number of degrees of freedom. This, for example, for solvated system is, uh, is what happened. This is the problem of simulating, uh, doing a replica exchange with the big proteins explicit solvent. What, what, what happens here is that to, to ensure a decent overlap between replica, you have really to, to put an incredible number of, uh, of replica to cover the same uh, temperature space. Okay, so I don't know if I have time. I can skip an uh, example of, uh, a very quickly, example of, uh, of a problematic system in which you have a uh, uh, peak in the specific heat, sorry. Uh, you can think of protein in implicit solvent or cosmic potential or even structure-based uh, Go model potential. I don't know if some of you are, have experience with that. Uh, a uh, potential that uh, basically promote just a native interaction. So you give, you feed the structure, a native structure, and you derive based on this native structure a set of uh, uh, parameter for your potential energy function in such a way to promote just the, favor just the interaction between atoms that are close in the native structure. This is a extremely used potential uh, to describe a mechanism of folding and uh, 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 many other things, and this is uh, one of those uh, kind of potential that has a phase transition, a, a peak in the specific heat at what's so called folding temperature. So if you want to do replica exchange with this kind of temperature, you have to optimize the distribution in this particular range. On the contrary, I will skip this. On the contrary, uh, when you put water in it, you pay a lot because you, you need to increase the number of replica, but as far as the distribution of replica is concerned, this makes your life easier. Because uh, when you think of the box of water, the, the, you can fairly assume that the specific heat is mainly dominated by water, and you can think it was almost constant. So you, you, when you have a constant specific heat, there is a clear receipt to distribute the replica. It's, it's just regular across, it's just a geometric progression across your temperature space. So you pay a price uh, and you need probably more replica, but you uh, don't have to bother too much in distributing them correctly. Uh, 
to be honest, the specific heat uh, of, of uh, some of the water uh, models that you use, SPC tip to three, is not constant. So there is a nice paper from 2011 that shows how the, this is the average energy func the average potential energy as a function of temperature. This is actually the logarithm of temperature. So you can see that it's, it's linear in this, uh, in this quantity. So the specific heat is the derivative of the average value of the energy with respect to your parameter, to the temperature. So um, you expect a linear relation when the specific heat is constant. Here, the linear relation is, is with the logarithm of t. So it's not constant at all. And actually, if you distribute the replicas uh, uh, with the recip of uh, specific cost, uh, constant, uh, specific, uniform specific uh, constant, what you obtain is that cold replica is a lower ac uh, acceptance, while hot replicas are as a higher acceptance. So in this paper, uh, they, the authors uh, give their own uh, recipe for the distribution of replicas uh, based on the fact that uh, specific heat has this uh, uh, dependency with temperature. So I think we are late. Uh, this is another thing that I will try to talk about in the next uh, uh, few lessons. So since the acceptance is determined by the overlap between the... Put yes? I'm going to ask, when you say that specificity is not very constant, that means it's not as... Because normally, this is a possible temperature. It's very much like it's a simulation-wise. It's a stronger temperature. Sorry, can you say it again? Normally, the specific heat of a substance is a function of temperature. Yes. So it's not very strong function of temperature. It's, it's, it was supposed to be, it was treated uh, in uh, almost all the uh, literature of uh, parallel temperature simulation explicit solvent as a constant quantities, which is, uh, in, in, in this range of temperature, is, is a weak dependence with the temperature. So uh, the approximation was not that bad. And if you look at the, the acceptance uh, uh, ratios based on this assumption, they change slightly in the temperature range, but uh, you can make them more uniform, which is what, what you want to, to gain. You want to make your life easier and try to uh, exchange uniformly across your temperature space. So uh, it was not bad because the, temp the dependence was not that different uh, from linear, but this is seems a much better approximation that leads to a much more uniform distribution um, acceptance rate across them. Does this answer your question? Okay. So another thing that I would like to show in the next few days is uh, how it's possible since the acceptance depends on the overlap between potential energy distribution, how to play a little bit with this distribution and make this overlap uh, uh, great, uh, larger without uh, 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 changing too much or changing your ensemble in a minimal way. And, uh, but this is, I don't have time for this. And uh, finally, uh, there are a lot of things to think about when you, when you do a parallel temporary or replicate change simulation. Uh, the third question is what uh, should I change in my, in my potential energy to to achieve better sampling or to cross barrier more easily. And uh, the first question is, is temperature always the best choice? And uh, for sure it, it's helpful when you have to cross uh, enthalpic barrier, but as Giovanni was uh, uh, showing in, in, in the slide of the previous lesson, sometimes your barrier are of an entropic type and that temperature is not helping a lot. So not always temperature is what you want to do. Uh, it, in my experience also, also for it for a uh, in study folding on small peptides uh, or even medium protein uh, is a still an, uh, a wise choice of temperature because there are uh, there are for sure enthalpic barriers uh, that need to be uh, crossed and it's it's uh, temperature is going to help. Even for other things, it might be uh, entropically driven, the process of folding. There are still residual or some uh, enthalpic barrier that temperature is really helping a lot. And you can easily uh, 
uh, try changing the maximum the range of temperature, the maximum extent of change uh, of your Hamiltonian, and you can see the efficiency or how fast you converge uh, your simulation at varying this maximum uh, uh, temperature. And I was very surprised uh, to see that uh, uh, even for small peptides, uh, uh, when you do parallel temperature up to 500 Kelvin, uh, and you see, okay, I'm eating my system too much for this uh, entropically driven system, you gain a little bit more even when you go to higher temperature, 600, 700, because there are still uh, things that enthalpic barriers that need to be crossed, even for small peptides of 20 uh, residues. So to what extent should they change the parameters? Uh, and I'm not giving a recipe here. I'm, I'm listing a list of references because it's a, it's a huge and vast uh, uh, argument with also different uh, kind of different positions. Uh, and for sure you need uh, uh, something different enough to accelerate to, to see uh, uh, an acceleration of your of your sampling how much which is the optimal if uh, uh, I'm, I, I have no recipe here for you but just a list of, uh, of, of paper that you have to read if you want to optimally uh, s uh, select your parameter and deal with your computational resources uh, I, I told you something about the distribution of replicas and what you have to take care of. Uh, and the problematic point are peaks in the specific heat. And uh, then another parameter is how fast am I exchanging between replica. Also here is a, is, a, is a vast problem, the reference for this. It turns out, I think, the general agreement is that you can uh, exchange as fast as possible. It's not, even if it's too fast because the exchange are somehow correlated, this is not uh, doing any harm. Uh, to your uh, simulation, but this is uh, at least uh, this is the reference paper I think for this uh, kind of uh, point of view. The only technical thing is that exchange it, exchange it between replicants require a communication between the CPUs, and this exchanging too much might slow down from a technical point of view your simulation because you are asking for information on remote nodes uh, too frequently. But this is can kind of uh, independent argument. And I think this is, uh, this is all because we need all of us a coffee. If there are, <laughs> there are questions on this uh, part?